screen. Tonight's program is about rethinking the lawn um, and how we can all uh, about sustainable lawn and garden care. And um, Eva Wheeling, uh, Silverstein is going to be talking with us uh, this evening and she is an exceptionally qualified person to be talking about the subject. She has a certificate in sustainable land management from the New York Botanical Garden. She is co-chair of the Glen Rock Shade Tree Committee um, committee, I think. Um, co-leader of the uh, Bergen Passaic Native Plant Society of New Jersey, and also the designer and creator of the uh, Native Pollinator Garden in front of Glen Rock's uh, Borough Hall, um, which I have to say the next time I am on my way to work. Um, and um, and thank you very much, everybody, for, for being here. I'll let um, Eileen get on. I'm sorry, Eileen, get on with this, and because I'm very interested. In Thanks so much, Thank you. I just want to make sure you can hear me clearly because you got very faded as you were speaking. So can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Okay, fine. Oh, good. So um, thank you for that. I think you might have put something in front of your mic or something like that. Yeah, um, your notes. That's not a good thing. That's what it was. Yes. Okay. Um, this. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this is a talk that was originally given in a slightly different form. Um, it was originally developed jointly um, for the Glen Rock Environmental Commission and the Glen Rock Shade Tree Advisory Committee, um, and which, because I am a Glen Rock resident and very active there, um, so I am very happy to present it in Ridgewood tonight. And I'd like to begin by introducing you to a friend of mine. So this is Susie the Spicebush Swallowtail. Um, she is going to appear at various times in the talk when there's something specific you can do to encourage um, her and her friends to come and live in your garden. And I think we're all happy when we see creatures like Susie in our garden. So that's my purpose tonight to um, get you to maybe do one or two things that will make your garden more sustainable. I'm going to make lots and lots of suggestions, but I hope you'll pick up just a few of them as, as we go along. There we go. Okay. Um, when I do this in person, obviously this is easier, but if you would look at these two backyards, and think about which one is more sustainable. We're going to develop a definition of sustainability in a minute. But first, just look at these two gardens and think which one might be more sustainable. These are actually two adjoining backyards in Glenrock. Um, so which one, which one would Susie prefer to live in? Just take, take a look for a minute. When I do it in person, obviously I can ask people to raise their hands and give me and you know and, and give me ideas and it works better, so I apologize. But um, but look for just a minute and we're gonna see these pictures again. Please add your thought your guesses in the chat. Yeah, please. Um, the um, the I think probably most people realize that the garden on the right was more sustainable. Um, but what sustainability, hmm? I think Dolores was going to mention that. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I think um, uh, sustainability is really, it's, it's kind of a hard com um, concept to get your mind around, but what it really boils down to is meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. In other words, it means using fewer non-renewable resources and using them more wise wisely when we do use them. When we're talking about gardening, when we're talking about our backyards, our, our, and in the suburbs, a really important thing to remember is in the suburbs, our backyards and front yards are the environment. Put them together, imagine you're looking at them from above, that's the environment, everybody's property. So all the little decisions we make about our property make a very big difference in the environment. The non-renewable resources that we use and that we use in enormous amounts in gardening are fresh water, which is a very precious natural resource. We tend to forget it because we have abundant rainfall and abundant groundwater in this area, but is on, in terms of the earth in general, it's a very limited resource. And also all of the petroleum based products, such as um, chemical fertilizers and fuels and pesticides and herbicides that we put on our properties. Those are all non renewable resources that we are using to um, a very great extent. 
Um, we'll look at some statistics about how just exactly how much we use these things in future. Um, the, um, I want to start out by just pointing out a couple of um, things. If you look at this picture, this is around the corner from where I live in Glen Rock. And if you look, it was taken, I think, around um, the beginning of September after a hot, dry summer. And you'll notice this is a property line right here. And you notice this lawn is nice and green because it's been sprinkled all summer. This lawn is brown because it hasn't been watered. But when I went back a week later after a rain, this lawn was just as green as this lawn. This lawn went dormant, but it didn't die. This lawn was kept green artificially with lots and lots of fresh water um, all summer long. Um, and probably lots and lots of chemicals too. I'd also like you to just quickly take a look at this picture, which as you can see shows the um, coast of the Atlantic Ocean off of New Jersey, Long Island, New York City. This is a, a plume, an algal plume um, that indicates a dead zone in the ocean. And this is coming from the Jersey shore and it's coming from our lawns um, primarily. We're gonna talk about this again later, but the average way that most people um, that most people manage their lawns and the rest of their property is having this kind of an effect on our wider environment. So all that as preface. Um, a little bit more about what a sustainable garden might be. This is a model that was developed by um, a city in Australia to show what a sustainable property might look like. So the plants are totally different from us as a tree fern, obviously, um, totally different from our plants, but the concept is exactly the same. Nature is pretty much the same everywhere, just the species are different. Um, if you wanna have um, a sustainable garden, you wanna have a diversity of habitats. You don't wanna have all lawn. Um, so if you notice, you've got tall trees, You've got mid-story trees. You've got a lot of vegetation on the ground level. You've got some water. You've got a little bit of messiness, some logs, some rocks, um, some, a lot of ground cover. Probably you're leaving some leaves. Um, this property is done exactly that way. Um, if you, and everything here was planted, by the way. Um, this was originally a very large lawn. Uh, about 25 years ago. So the, you have tall trees, you have shorter trees and shrubs. Um, you have a patio, you have lots of nice living space. Um, I don't know if you can see it because for me, our little vignettes are over part of this picture, but um, there is a little bit of lawn here. If you wanna play, you know, wanna play soccer with the kids, kick a ball around, there's plenty of space to do it. There's a water feature in the back in the form of just a bird bath. There's places for people to sit. This patio is built out of uh, permeable paving. There's wide spaces between the stones. So you don't, you never have standing water. You don't have a problem because of the hardscape. Um, and there's, there's uh, fruit, there's flowers, there's lots of uh, stuff for pollinators. There's always birds nesting in here. So this is a model. This is a model of a sustainable garden. And this is what you could do in the suburbs. Obviously, this is a very informal garden. It could be done formally just as well um, using the same plants, but arranged differently. And if you have something like this, Susie is gonna be very happy to come live in your garden. You're gonna see her and her friends. Um, ecologists like to say that if your plant's leaves are not being chewed, you're doing something wrong. Um, insects are absolutely vital to a sustainable landscape. Um, the first thing, the first change of mindset that's really important is to learn not to reach for the spray can. Um, insects are the basis of the food of the food web after plants. They eat plants and then everybody else eats them. Um, I just want to show you some of these guys. These, I think these pictures are all from my own garden. Um, I don't know if you can see, can you see this very weird looking creature up here or is the, you can, I know you can move this little vignette if it's covering it. Can you see this weird, does anybody know what this is? I, unfortunately, I can't ask you to raise your hands. <laughs> does anybody know? Raise that little blue hand or just add it to the, or add your thoughts to the chat. Yeah, I'll, I'll just wait. I can't see the chat, but if you, um, but, take, but yeah. you can see. But uh, if you know what this guy is, um, you know, say it. I'm, my guess is that nobody does. This is a monarch butterfly caterpillar happily eating milkweed. This is a, um, I think they're called wasp 
waste. This is why wasps are wasp wastes are called that because of this um, very narrow waste that this has. So this guy is not at all vicious. It's a pollinator. Um, you need this guys like this in your garden. Spiders in your garden are your friends. All they do is eat other bugs. They're completely predatory. They eat other bugs. I'm not sure if anybody recognizes this guy, but this is a ladybug larva. If you spray this one, you're not gonna get ladybugs to come eat your aphids. Um, in my garden, when I see, usually I see the ladybugs first, and then I wonder where the aphids are. I'll look around for them because um, there's no, there are no chemicals used and, um, and there's a great variety of plants. So I might have a little bit of aphids on the tip of one plant and the ladybugs are gonna find it right away, but I'm never gonna have a widespread problem because I'm never gonna have a monoculture, which is what aphids go for. So has anybody figured out what this is? No? Okay, this yeah. is a fire, no, no, no? Okay, this is a firefly larva. So this guy would live under the ground. Here's a firefly, an adult firefly. You might not even know what they look like. We have several species, but this is one of them. And uh, this is an adult firefly. And this is its larva. And it's really ugly. And, uh, and it would just live in the soil or under a rock for a couple of years. And then it would emerge as this beautiful creature. It would climb up into your shrubs and it would um, and start to glow. I kind of judge the sustainability of a garden. If you take a walk at dusk in about a month, just in your neighborhood, see which gardens have fireflies. That's gonna tell you a lot about how those gardens are maintained. Um, because if you um, routinely put pesticides on your, I'm gonna talk about this in spe specifically, but if you, if you wanna see fireflies, if you wanna see ladybugs, if you wanna see butterflies, you cannot use pesticides. It's the first thing. All of these guys are friends, and you want to see, you want to see a variety of insects in our gardens. And also, um, an insect protein is the main food for almost all baby birds. Um, if you do not have insects, you will not have birds nesting in your garden. And I think we all like that. And um, you, um, and if you don't, I'm going to talk more about native plants. If you don't plant native plants, you're not going to have insects because Everybody knows, I think, that monarch butter, monarch caterpillars can only eat milkweed, native milkweed. What most people don't realize is that every butterfly and every moth and many other insects are just that specific. They have to have specific native plants or they cannot live. So um, one of the reasons for the insect, a cop, a cop, I can't even say that right, that the, we have this enormous decline in the number of insects we're seeing and, and also in the number of birds is that people are not planting native plants and, and vast stands of you know, natural areas with native plants have been destroyed. So I'd like you to just sort of keep this in mind as we go on, you wanna see insects. Um, and finally, what's wrong with a few violets? I often get asked, how can I get rid of violets in my lawn? And if I feel comfortable with the person, I say, why would you want to? And, uh, and if I don't feel comfortable, I say, you really should talk to another horticulturist or another, you know, or another person, I'm not the person for you. So um, you, um, this is a great spangled fritillary. I told you just a minute ago that all butterflies are just as specific as, as monarch butterflies will, with milkweeds. The larvae of great spangled fritillaries eat the leaves of violets and nothing else. If you kill violets, you're killing fritillaries. Why would you want to kill this? It's beautiful. It's nectaring on milkweed here. This is orange butterfly weed. Um, why would you want to not encourage this? So take this instead of Susie for this um, in this slide. But you, but why would you not want to encourage this in your garden? If you use pesticides or you use herbicides that kill broadleaf broadleaf weeds in your lawn, you're never gonna see this guy. Um, violets in a lawn, perfectly fine. Here they are. I think my husband had to lie down on the ground to take this picture, but I love this picture. Um, the, um, uh, so there they are in the lawn. I very frequently have um, in my perennial beds, which um, this time of year are just starting to grow. Um, very often I get a sort of an underlayer 
of some native um, ground covers, um, including violets. There are some others that come in there too. And I encourage them because they're, um, they're helping the soil. They are, um, they are covering the soil, they're preventing erosion. And um, when, the, when the plants grow up, these plant, the plants in this particular bed are gonna be like six feet tall in a few months, but when they, when they grow up, they're going to um, um, hide the um, shade out the violets, which is what the violets like anyway. So something like that at the basis of a perennial bed is perfectly fine. If you really don't like them in your lawn, dig them out, not too hard to dig out. They have these fat rhizomes, dig them out and put them in your perennial beds or your shady, or your shady borders, but don't kill them by using, um, by using herbicides. Okay, that was all preliminary, um, the, the big picture. I wanna to talk to you um, for a few minutes specifically about lawns because that is after all the title of this talk. So sustainable lawn care really involves doing less but getting much more um, for it. Um, we're not gonna go through all this and it's purposely overwhelming. Um, the, the bottom line is that the average lawn is not sustainable. The way most people, the way the average person, whether or not they use a lawn service, I'm assuming most people I'm talking to are using a lawn service, but there are things you can do whether you use a lawn service, because if you do, you're paying for it. So you're paying for a lot of things you don't need. Um, uh, there are things you can do whether you do it yourself or whether you use a lawn service. But um, in general, um, uh, in general, the way we manage our lawns in this country, um, our lawns produce four times more carbon dioxide than they absorb. We think of plants as carbon sinks, as things that absorb carbon dioxide and therefore can help to mitigate global warming. The way we manage our lawns, we are actually adding to global warming. By, um, and the way we're doing that is we're using enormous amounts of um, um, with of um, we're spewing all this stuff into the air when we use um, electric um, gasoline powered lawnmowers and leaf blowers because the engines are not regulated the way car engines are. There's no restriction on the kinds of chemicals and the kinds of um, fumes that they can give off. So you're giving off enormous amounts of greenhouse gases when you use lawnmowers. Um, you can. Um, it's very interesting to know that lawns cover about 20% of the state of New Jersey. So it's not a small problem. If everybody, if all homeowners continue to maintain their lawns in this very unsustainable way, it's really not a small problem at all. And I'm not gonna go through all this in general, but um, you have problems with, um, with gas emissions, you have problems with yard waste and landfills, there are problems of runoff from, um, from synthetic um, fertilizers that are going into our lakes and streams. Um, we have problems with noise, enormous amounts of noise from these machines, and just enormous amount of money and time that we spend in caring for our lawns. And in most cases, we're doing things that are not even helpful to the lawn. So let's go to some specifics. When you water, there are, uh, there are, water, there are ways to water sustainably, but most people water unsustainably. The best way to water is to water less often, but more deeply. And this will encourage a deep, healthy root system. Most people, when they water their lawns, they, um, they water just a tiny bit. They put their sprinklers on, the automatic sprinkler systems for just a few minutes a day. So you're giving a very shallow amount of water. Shallow watering will, will promote shallow root growth. Um, deep watering will encourage deep root growth. The grass will be stronger and healthier and it will be able to, um, to fight back against diseases and pests, which a, a weak grass, weak, weak plants cannot do. And um, you'll, you'll find that you'll have to water much less often if you, um, if you water deeply and let the plants develop deep roots. Um, better yet, better than, better than water. And the thing about most sprinkler systems is that most people have no idea how little water they're actually putting out. Um, what you really wanna give out, give to any plant, not just lawns, um, any plant that needs watering is an inch of water a week. 
Um, the way you know how much, um, how long it takes to, to deliver an inch of water is to put a container on the ground. It's pretty simple. Or put out a, um, a little tiny a plastic rain gauge. You can buy one for a dollar and uh, stick it in the lawn and you'll know when you've got um, an inch of water. This goes for newly planted shrubs and trees. It's very important to give them an inch of water a week. Um, but, um, but my guess is that if you try this with your sprinkler system, it's gonna take much longer than you think. It might take an hour and a half and you probably run your sprinkler system for seven, eight, 10 minutes. Um, you're really not giving your lawn um, what it needs by, by all that water. And plus you're wasting a lot of water just putting it into the atmosphere most of the time with most sprinkler systems. So you're wasting water and you're, um, and you're, not, um, you're not really helping the plants all that much. Better yet for um, a lawn than deep watering is no water at all. And this is what happens when you give a plant, when you give a lawn no water at all, it, turn, it does turn brown, but as soon as it rains, it would look just like this. Um, so you can do that. Our lawn grasses are um, cool season grasses that cannot survive our summers, basically, or they, can, they cannot uh, stay green in our summers. They don't die, they go dormant in hot, dry weather. So if you simply allow your lawn to go dormant, as soon as it rains or as soon as the weather cools off in the fall, it will green up again. Um, the, um, you can also, a really good way to save water is to retrofit your sprinkler system so you don't water the hardscape. Um, I unfortunately have not been able to find a good picture of this, but um, sprinkler systems, if you notice this, this um, sprinkler head is going to revolve, so to cover the whole lawn, but this is also going to swing around and it's going to water the sidewalk to get out to the grass strip by the curb. Instead of that, so that's wasting a lot of water on the sidewalk. It's probably wasting a lot of water on the driveway, which is over here in this house, um, as, as this one swings around. You can put in, um, put in sprinkler heads that do not cover the hardscape. The, you can put in a small sprinkler head, a couple of small sprinkler heads in this strip that would um, just water the strip and not water the sidewalk or the street. I don't know if you're like me and you walk a dog a lot, you have to duck, go out into the street to duck sprinklers all the time. Luckily in Glen Rock, we have sidewalks in most places, but in other places they don't. But um, you're, um, but, but that's, that's really wasted water when you're watering the sprinklers, when you're watering the, the hardscape. Um, the, um, there is a very good EPA site, and I'm going to put up a whole list of references as my last slide, and this will be part of it. But um, this is um, an EPA site about smart watering that I recommend. Um, so I'm going to move on from watering. So the thing is to um, water less, but water smart. Lawn chemicals. Um, what I think of when, when I think of the amount of stuff that people put on their lawns, it's kind of like giving a healthy person cancer therapy, <laughs> cancer drugs. It's gonna kill them. They're, um, it's, it's not good for you. It's not good for anybody to just pour on medicine when you don't need it. That's, that's how I think of what most people do. Most, um, most lawn care systems um, fertilize and put down um, pesticides and fungicides four or five times in the growing season, which is completely unnecessary. Um, if you think about what green plants do, they make their own food. They don't need food from us. And they've been making their own food for about 400 million years, whereas we've only been around for about 200,000. So plants can take care of themselves really well without us pouring on um, fertilizer, um, which simply goes into the water system and makes green monkey ponds like this. Um, so the, the, all of the pesticides and the fungicides and the herbicides that you're putting down on the lawn they are unnecessary for the most part. They pollute the water and they're harmful to humans and pets and wildlife. If you put down pesticides, you are never gonna see Susie. Um, you should fertilize less or not at all. Best practice for fertilizing a lawn is to use, to fertilize once a year, preferably in early fall. We used to say Labor Day, but now it's still hot on Labor Day. So say toward the end of September, using a slow acting organic fertilizer. Slow acting organic, both terms extremely important. 
when you look at the bag of fertilizer, it should have things like ground up chicken feathers and, and, um, and bone meal and stuff like that with words you can understand, not chemical names, because that's what this is made of. You want it to be slow acting because most of the fertilizer we put on our lawn, all these synthetic um, chemicals, they are extremely volatile and they just disappear. They're not doing anything to the lawn. You want it to stay there so it has time to do some good to the lawn. Most of what you apply um, is simply getting flushed away into the groundwater. It's going into the groundwater and into the lakes and the streams. Now we drink the groundwater. So um, we, cause we, we drink well water here in Glen Rock and Ridgewood. So, um, I wish everybody would stop doing this. You're paying for it too. So I would suggest you talk to your lawn care provider about doing less and just you're, you're paying for a lot of stuff you don't need. Um, I would, if, if they're fertilizing four times a year, ask them to do it only three times a year and see what happens. I would bet you that it's, the lawn is still nice and green. Better yet, follow this practice. There are, um, there are more and more there are organic um, lawn care services, but make sure that what they're using really is organic and slow acting because organic can mean different things in different contexts. Um, other sustainable techniques for lawn management. Mulch while you mow. Ask them to take the bag off the mower and let the clippings lie on the grass. That is free fertilizer. They will break down very, very quickly. In hot weather, they'll be gone in a day or two and they're, they're returning the nutrients back into the lawn. Um, you could also use those in your compost, but it's better to just leave them on the lawn. It's really easy. If you can switch to electric powered rather than gas powered equipment, you're making an enormous difference in terms of greenhouse gases. And electric equipment is, being, is improving all the time. So the next time you need to replace your mower, um, you, you might wanna look into this for um, both for lawn mowers and for leaf blowers. If you use a lawn service, there are some that use electric equipment. Um, I'm, I am hearing about this more and more. Let the grass grow long. Set the mower blades to at least three inches. Um, you'll have to mow less often, first of all, so you'll be using um, less fuel. Um, longer grass can just can carry out more photosynthesis than shorter grass, and it will grow healthy and strong. So these are all techniques to make the grass um, stronger and more healthy, and therefore it will not need all the inputs that we feel that we have to put in. The most important thing about lawn management, and this is a question I get asked all the time, which is, why can't I grow grass here? Well, there are places where grass won't grow. Grass is a plant, lawn grasses are adapted to sunny sites. They won't grow where it's shady and they won't grow where it is very wet. Um, so if you have a spot that's either shady or very wet or both, grow something else. And there's lots and lots of things you can grow instead of grass. Um, um, you might want to eliminate some lawn. This, for example, is a shade garden. It's in a, it's in a part of a, um, of a property that's extremely shady and it's all full of native plants that are gonna bloom throughout the season. This is um, a moss garden. I found this picture. This is not grass, this is moss. Um, so this is a very shady site and they just let the moss take over and it serves the same purpose as a lawn, but it requires no maintenance at all. Um, and by the way, don't let anybody tell you, and this is something that lawn care companies love to say, don't let them tell you that you need, um, the reason that you have um, moss in your lawn is because you need lime. That's what you'll hear. You, I hear that all the time. The, um, the, um, the soil is too acidic, they have to lime it, and then there won't be moss. The reason there's moss is that it's shady. That's where moss grows. It's not because of the chemistry of the soil. Um, so don't let anybody tell you that you need, you need that. And in this area, almost nobody needs lime. Um, our, our soil is, in general, is um, exactly right. It's just slightly acid, which is right for a vast range of plants. Um, so that is lawn care. And I'm going to stop for questions now. So if people have any questions, you can add them to the Q&A if you'd like, or if you raise your hand, I can put you on this, um, on kind of on, hand you the mic uh, if you prefer to do that too. I don't know if there was anything left in there. There's stuff in the chat. 
Yes, and I people are wondering about the recording. So the recording will be available on the library's website um, or the link to the recording will be um, on the YouTube page for the library. And you get to our YouTube channel through our, um, the YouTube link on our homepage. Um, and let's see, we have a couple of questions now. Are there any local lawn services you recommend that know all this stuff? Um, I, I'm very hesitant to recommend in a public forum like this, and I don't personally use a lawn care service because I use a person who will do exactly what I say, and that's my husband. So I don't, I, I've never used a lawn care service, so I don't know. I have heard um, on Facebook that there are some that are, that are more organic and that use electric equipment. So I would say post it in a, um, like in a Facebook forum. I know there, um, I'm, I tend to be on the Glenrock ones, but I'm sure there are some in Ridgewood too. Um, there might be um, some, some Facebook forums that are more um, geared towards sustainability and you might find something like that. But no, I can't recommend any of that. In fact, there's a Sustainable Ridgewood website, a sustainableridgewood.org and their Facebook uh, page too, uh, that, that you get to be able to find some information or put out a request there. I would, I would bet the folks on your environmental commission would know that. Yes, Green Ridgewood, mm -hmm. which is a Facebook page. Uh, and Carol is wondering about types of plants to grow in shade. She's wondering if, if you could tell. I'm actually gonna talk about that at the very end of the talk, but there are many, many, many beautiful native plants that will grow in shade. So I'm gonna show you a few at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and Lev is wondering, we just moved into a house with a bare and slightly overgrown lawn. Where should we start? I think I would start by thinking, um, when you say bare, I assume you don't mean there's nothing there. I assume you mean it's weedy or it looks sparse, but not that there's absolutely nothing there because plants grow anywhere. Um, but so anyway, I would, I would start by taking a look at it and seeing if maybe those bare places are places where it's too shady or too wet for a lawn. Just, you know, watch it for a season or so. To start out, just cut what grows. Don't start trying to remove stuff. Um, see what you've got. And then um, after a season, you will get a sense of where the grass will grow and where it won't. And then you might want to start to plant in those areas, to start plant other things in those areas where the grass won't grow. This is a starting place. I hope that's helpful. And we also have some programs in our sustainability series that might help you out too, <laughs> love. Uh, someone else is wondering how to treat weeds in the lawn. Um, well, it depends on what you mean by weeds. Um, the, uh, if you really don't like them, dig them up. Um, I mean, I realize some things really do take over. I would just mow what grows. I would, that's what people used to do. They didn't, um, they didn't treat weeds. They, they mowed everything that grew and pretty much it'll look, it'll all look green if you mow it, mow it all to the same height. Um, so it really, when you talk, when you start to talk about treating weeds, there are so many questions involved, like what do you, a, a weed is just a plant that one particular person um, thinks is in the wrong place. There's no other definition of a weed. What you think is a weed, I may very well not think is a weed. And if you're talking about violets, certainly I don't think those are weeds. There are lots of other native things that sort of pop up in lawns. Um, there are weeds that are more or less unsightly, certainly. Um, but I would, but you have to know what you're dealing with and what your degree of tolerance is for a less than perfect lawn before you can start to talk about treating them. But for most things, um, it's hard to be just, you know, digging them out, find out what kind of a root it has, and then you'll, you'll know how to, um, how to dig it out. It's good exercise too. Yeah, I have one of those, it looks like a bent screwdriver thing to, for the dandelions that, to try to get out the dandelion roots. Um, David is wondering, how can I assess if a gardener is really focused on practicing sustainable practices? Um, I guess I would, I would ask him how often he's fertilizing, and you should know that anyway because you're paying for it. Um, how often is he fertilizing? Is, um, you know, what is he putting down on your garden? Um, what is he doing? We're going to talk about leaves um, and composting soon. What is he doing with your leaves? And that's a lot of what you, it's a lot of it is based on what you tell him. Um, 
they're gonna they're not gonna practice sustainable practices. It's a, it's um, unless you kind of insist. For the most part, this is what I hear all the time. Um, you need to you need to um, be the one who asks questions. And then, you know, like, what are you putting on my lawn? Why are you putting that on my lawn? Um, would be would be the first questions to ask. And Bill is wondering, I hear clover is a good ground cover, but I but don't deer like clover. You know, I don't know. Deer like pretty much everything. I don't know about clover in particular. Um, clover certainly, um, I wouldn't dig it out of a lawn. Um, I do dig it out of my native plant beds because it's not native, but um, but I do. Um, I certainly am happy to have it in my lawn. It also fixes nitrogen, so it's good for the lawn. Um, I don't. I don't know specifically about deer and clover. There are all kinds of lists of um, of plants that supposedly the deer more or less avoid, and um, I can show you an, an exception to every one of them. There's a great article in Today's Times by Margaret Roach, who is a wonderful um, writer, or is it Margaret Renkel? There's, it's in Today's Times about deer and managing uh, managing gardens for deer. Excellent article, just in, just in Today's Times. We also had a, a program in early March, I think, um, with Lourdes Osorio on- Oh yeah, uh-huh. Deer resistant, yeah. deer resistant native planting and we also included a list of uh, deer resistant native plants and places where you might even mm -hmm. she um she's right she's spoken to our native plant chapter and i did a she came and filled my garden for her youtube channel um uh -huh. last year so that's that's online um a little tour of my garden so um yeah she's she's very good um there, but there's really you know deer seem to have culture they seem to eat deer and they must tell each other because they seem to eat different things in different areas because there's a there's a list on the Native Plant Society state website, but it was done by somebody in southern New Jersey and I can tell you up here they eat different things. So um, there are a couple of things that deer will avoid there or they'll eat them as a last resort and those are milkweeds. Um, although la last year was terrible, they ate everything because we had had an extremely mild winter. Um, so they ate, oh my God, it was just awful. But um, they, for the most part, they avoid milkweeds, which are poisonous. They avoid native grasses, which are full of little silica particles. So they hurt when they eat them. And although not all native grasses, and they avoid any plant in the mint family, which is um, Minarda, bergamot, um, or, um, or uh, mountain mints, or there's many, many native plants in the mint family, and they all have great flowers that pollinators absolutely adore. So those are three things, although last year, as I said, they ate everything. Um, it was uh, um, between the deer and the rabbits and the woodchucks. Every, it was just an awful year. I had one aster bloom last year because I've just never seen anything like it because they just get, re they're not going to die. The plants are, gonna, are coming back, but everything got eaten down to the ground. Um, yeah, it was, it was both climate changes. We have a very warm winter. They don't die off. And also the year that last fall, not this past fall, but the year before was a mast year when all the plant, all the trees get together and make an excessive amount of acorns and beech nuts and, and, um, and, and other tree nuts. And the trees communicate, they get together, they do it, and there's an enormous amount of food. So fewer of, of these animals die off. Um, so it, everything came together with the warm winter last year. I've really never seen anything like it, <laughs> but it's better this year. I think I, I remember <laughs> that too. All those chipmunks, so many chipmunks. Um, I haven't seen one this year yet. Last year it was it was like, I, yeah, I've never seen anything like it, but I, I think I heard one today first time I heard the squeak for the first time, but I haven't seen them yet. That's true. Um, yeah. and Dan is just wondering more about that. I don't know if deer resistant um, plants, uh, when you get into mentioning specific, so you've, you've mentioned a lot of um, deer resistant plants already and where people can find information about them. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, George is wondering what can be done about wild strawberries in a lawn? They are spreading rapidly. I think I would eat them. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I, I'm wondering if they really are strawberries. If they have yellow flowers, they're not strawberries. They're false strawberries and they don't taste very good. If they have white flowers, they may actually be strawberries. Um, and in which case I would just, you know, let, let a garden bed develop around them and maybe fence them off from the critters. But um, my guess is that they're probably the mock strawberries that have, um, they have yellow flowers and they do have little red berries and they are edible and critters will eat them, but they don't taste good. Um, so those, I mean, if you, if you consider them long weeds, you might want to dig them out and they go on runners like, um, like regular strawberries. So just look at the flowers. They're blooming now. So you would know immediately yellow flowers. They're not really strawberries. Um, let me see. Um, do you have any thoughts about lawn soil conditioners such as, um, oh my gosh, I, we make, wait, uh, some kind of acid, um, fulvic acid and sea kelp. H U I M C acid, humic acid. I would not put anything on a lawn. I would not put put anything on any healthy plant. And the way to restore your soil, um, the the chemical fertilizers are actually um, chemically they are salts, and they over time degrade the soil structure. So if you stop using them, you are going to see. Um, some problems with your plants. Your, your plants are not gonna be as vigorous because the soil has become degraded. But the way to get over that is to, um, is to just wait. Um, it may take a couple of years, but your soil will restore itself as stuff breaks down into it. This, and, and then um, microorganisms can move into it, which is not happening when you're using chemical fertilizers. The soil will restore itself. It takes a couple of years. Um, if you change from um, a, an all non-organic to an all organic uh, method of managing a lawn particularly, it's not gonna look good for a couple of years because the soil has to restore itself. But I would let that happen naturally. There is so much going on in soil. It's so complex. Um, both the physics and the chemistry of what's going on in soil is immensely complex and we actually don't know all that much about it. So I would, I would leave it alone and let it take care of itself. I would do things like let the grass clippings stay there, use some um, chopped leaves. I'm gonna talk about that in the next section, but, re but try to restore it with these natural means the way, the way that nature would do it. Um, if, you, if you feel that your soil has been degraded and it will have been if you've been using these chemicals for a long time. So I don't know about specific products because I tend not to use any products because they're simply not necessary for the most part. And uh, someone is wondering about peat moss. It's gen is generally not sustainable. Do you have any recommendations for alternatives when overseeding? Um, use a little bit of your compost if you have it or just use a peat free potting soil, just a little bit to scatter. Um, I, when I, if I need to seed like a little patch of lawn, I would just scatter a little bit of my compost right over it. So I think that's I think that's what you're talking about. It's true that peat moss is not is not sustainable. Using peat moss is not sustainable. You must be watching Monty Don, which I am. <laughs> British gardening show. <laughs> um, oh boy, Carol has a good question. What do you do about poison ivy? Ah, uh, okay. Um, poison ivy is. Um, it has an unfortunate common name. It is um, a native vine that is fabulous for wildlife. Um, and it's called, poison is the bad name because it's an allergy. And I realize it's a serious allergy for people who have it, but everybody doesn't have it. Um, about 30% of the population is not allergic to poison ivy. So they can handle, I, I am not allergic to poison ivy. You can handle it with impunity, it's fine. Poison ivy, if it climbs a tree, say in the back of your garden, leave it alone. That's bird food. If once, it, once a vine gets up into the canopy, it's, it's doing that to reach the sun. It then will flower and fruit. And that's a really, really popular bird food, um, the berries of poison ivy. In natural areas where you see it, it's, it's really a good thing. Of course, you want to keep it out of an area where children play. Um, because you don't want to find out that they're allergic and a nasty, it's a, it is a nasty allergy to people who have it. Um, you want to keep it out of areas that you use. It is, it is tend to like most vines and most native vines, it is an enthusiastic plant. So if you find it growing, you should keep an eye on it. But um, 
I would wear, I guess if I were allergic, I would wear um, good strong gloves and I would put like an overcoating on myself that I could immediately take off and wash um, if I were going to be handling it. Um, as it is now, I don't handle it without gloves, but I'm not terribly careful. Um, I've heard you can develop the allergy, so um, I, so I don't go out of my way to touch it. But I would keep I would keep it out of areas you use. But I would not be worried about it if it were if I had say a large property and it, there was some of it in the back. It's not going to kill trees when it climbs them the way um, the way that English ivy will, for example, or or um, or um, some uh, some non-native vines will kill trees. George was um, clarifying that he well, he was talking about uh, the strawberries with yellow, yellow flowers. I was thinking that that might have, must have been it. And oh, and it was humic acid for oh, that other question about adding things. And we have one last question um, about how often should you aerate or when do you recommend aerating? Aeration is done, and aeration means um, poking little holes in the lawn to make little bits of sod come out so that um, it, it's, it's done for one reason only, for compaction. Um, if you have an area that has been very heavily compacted, like I was, I was looking at somebody's property recently, and they had, um, they had a, a, a circle maybe eight feet wide, and absolutely nothing would grow there. And I said, "Did you used to have a kiddie pool here?" And they said, "Yes." So, so that the soil in that area was so heavily compacted that nothing could grow in it. So that would be a good candidate for aeration. Um, if you have like maybe an area of your lawn that's sparse because you walk in that particular area all the time, that's aeration. Aeration is not needed for the average lawn. Um, it's, it's for areas that are very heavily compacted, and then you might have somebody do it. Um, but that's, I would only do it if you really just didn't see anything growing there. Um, that's, and what it does is it brings some cores out so that the, so the, the water can get in. We do have one last question here. Our lawn is generally okay, but we have small patchy areas throughout. The grass doesn't seem to propagate horizontally. We've reseeded multiple times, but the condition persists. Typical of lawns in this area. I think Dan is wondering what to do. Um, well, it would depend on the reason. Um, if it's just too shady, um, that might be a place where you want you might want to just plant something else. I mean, generally speaking, if you try a plant in an area two or three times and it doesn't take, you should plant something else. So um, I've never had any luck or I've never heard of people having luck with um, say seed mixes for shade, grass seed mixes for shade, because grass is for sun. Basically all the plants are, all the plants are adapted to sun. Um, I would, I would look at what the area is like. Is it too wet? Is it too shady? Is it compacted? And, and um, plant for that kind of situation um, or fix the compaction if, that, if that's the problem. Okay, so we actually had a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Mark is wondering how much leaves or clippings can you leave on your lawn? Oh, okay. Um, for clippings, leave it all. Just leave it all. Um, it'll be fine. It will disappear very, very quickly, in, and particularly in hot weather. Even this time of year, it disappears quickly. Um, so there's no problem with that. With leaves, um, I'm going to talk about that in the next section, but you need to know how much your mower can take care of, can handle. So that's really just a matter of, um, of finding, you know, just doing it with a thin layer and making sure your mower can, can chop that. And then if it can, you know, trying a slightly, a slightly um, thicker layer. So it depends, it depends on the mower. And also, do we didn't talk about plants to grow in shade, did we? Somebody's wondering about... I am going to show you some in the very mm -hmm. last slide. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so I think there might be a couple others. Um, so, oh, somebody is just, oh, poison ivy, a lot of leaves. How, how do you, oh, do you mulch leaves in the fall? Well, yeah, because that's when you get them. So we're going to talk, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Can too many leaves kill the grass or daylilies? Um, yes. If you have a, a very thick layer of leaves so that no blades of grass show through, yes, it will kill the grass. But that's a good way to kill grass if you want to kill grass to plant something else, by the way. But um, yeah, so you, um, I mean, any plant has to have its green part exposed or it's going to die. You can, you can smother any plant by that way, but just by covering it with leaves to get a big enough pile. Yeah. 
we still have other questions waiting. Um, any tips for above ground irrigation? The Ridgewood water restrictions make it very difficult to get the entire lawn watered in such a short window. Well, I don't know specifically what your restrictions are, but we're, um, I know that we, we usually can water every other day and you can water, there's a window like in the morning and in the evening. I mean, I don't water my lawn, but so, so I don't know, but um, I would think you can um, just do, if you, if you do what I've mentioned and water deeply once a week, water a different part on different days. That's, um, you know, just, you just have to know how long um, it has to be on to, to give you that inch of water. Um, and you're going to have enough time um, to do that. I would think you're going to have enough time. You might have to turn it on real early in the morning, but um, which is better anyway. But um, I would think you'd have enough time. So just water different parts on different days. I think that would work. Seems to work. And um, when David is wondering, when you would you recommend thatching for a lawn? I don't. But um, it's real hard work. I've done it. It's it's really hard work. It's just you know raking up that other. You could um, I don't know if the lawn seems to be less vigorous or if it seems like there's really really a the reason the thatch develops. Excuse me. Let me backtrack. The reason the fat the thatch develops is that you basically have dead soil with no organisms in it. Wait, if you had you microorganisms or a little or insects in your soil, you wouldn't have as much thatch. So. Well, Thatch is that layer of dead grass on the surface of the soil, under the grass. If you manage a lawn organically, you're not going to have a thick thatch, thick thatch layer because the um, organisms are going to break it all down. Um, that happens when a when a lawn is um, basically if you're if you're putting chemical fertilizers all the time, your soil is dead, so nothing can live in it um, to take care of the thatch. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe, um, you know, start managing it organically or maybe, you know, do it once to, uh, to let the air grow in there. But if the lawn looks okay, I would think I would, I think I would not do it. I think you are clear to continue now. I think we're Okay. That was a lot of questions. Great <laughs> robust q and yeah, I'm going to have to go fast now. <laughs> okay. So leave the leaves. Um, um, there, there is a program in many parts of the country um, um, called Leave the Leaves, and if you, um, if you Google this phrase, you will find it. Um, Bedford, New York, um, Englewood, um, a couple of, well, mostly college towns, maybe even Montclair, I don't know. They have programs where they don't collect leaves anymore because they want people to recycle leaves on, on their property. Um, so leaves are a renewable resource. And they are valuable in many, many ways in a garden. You don't want to push your leaves to the curb. Um, let's talk about the big picture real quick. When, um, when my sons were um, in the Cub Scouts, I used to lead Cub Scout groups. This is 25 years ago. I used to lead Cub Scout groups through the woods. And I would always ask them what happened to last year's leaves. And they didn't know. And today I'm a docent at the Glen Rock Arboretum. And when I ask this question, there's usually a kid who knows what happened, to, which is really a great, a, it's a great advance. What happened to last year's leaves is that they've been turned into soil. Um, so if you leave your leaves, you're gonna have better soil because you're gonna have this lovely rich soil um, that, that um, you're, you're basically giving away the richness of your soil when you get rid of your leaves. Um, if you leave leaves, and I don't mean leave them on the grass where they fall. We're gonna use them in particular ways. But um, if you leave your leaves on your property, you will see all this wildlife. And I didn't put Susie here, but she should be here because you're gonna have butterflies and moths. You're gonna have birds. I have birds, um, these, these wonderful mixed species foraging flocks. They come through all winter long. I don't hang feeders, but they're, what they're doing is they're sifting through the leaves that are under my plants to find insects. Um, that's That's, the best food there is for birds. You're gonna have possibly even newts and salamanders, which would be real exciting. Um, you're gonna have lots and lots of wildlife, maybe even toads. You're certainly gonna see um, native bees, which for the most part nest in the ground and are solitary. You're gonna see fireflies if you leave your leaves alone. Um, so that's the, that's the big picture of why. Um, instead of blowing your leaves to the curb, there are some very specific things you can use them for in your property. They are excellent lawn fertilizer and they are free. They are excellent mulch and they are free. They can be turned into compost and they are excellent habitat. And that really goes along with, with the others. 
So I'm gonna look at all of those things very, very quickly. Leaves are free fertilizer for your lawn. It does not make sense to have somebody blow your leaves away and then put down fertilizer. The leaves are the fertilizer. Instead of discarding the leaves, mulch them into the lawn by mowing over them. And you don't need any kind of special mulching mower. Um, you, any mower will do this, just mow right over the leaves the way you would mow over grass and it will break them into very small pieces. Um, the, uh, those little pieces will break down really quickly. It's the same as the grass clippings. It will release nutrients into the lawn and that's free fertilizer. I no longer recommend that people do this with all of their leaves because when you do this, you're chopping up butterfly larvae. <laughs> so we're gonna, so you don't wanna do it with all your leaves, but if you do it with some of them, maybe do it with one layer of leaves. And then uh, you wouldn't wanna let an awful lot accumulate on your grass because it will eventually, if you have six, eight inches of leaves and you don't see any green, it will kill the grass. You can't, you can't just leave it there. Um, you, have to, you have to either mow over them or you have to blow them aside and use them for something else at one point. But first, first use free lawn fertilizer. Free mulch. Um, this is just a bed that has been mulched by raking the leaves from the lawn onto, onto the bed. Um, so in other words, why pay somebody to remove the leaves and then to put down mulch? This is mulch. Um, and at the same time, here's Susie. Here is Susie's larva, which um, she is a spice bush swallowtail. This is a corner of my front yard. And there's no spice bush right here, but there is spice bush about 40 feet to the right, um, right in the front of my garden. So if Susie had been born in that spice bush, she would have eaten the leaves of it. And then when, and then when she was big enough, she would have dropped to the ground and pupated. So this is her caterpillar. This is what her pupa looks like when it's first formed. And this is how it's gonna spend the winter. Um, and it's gonna spend the winter in these leaves. Um, so she and all her friends are going to be right down for the winter. So um, this, this um, form of mulch is the natural mulch. It will break down into your soil and enrich your soil. Um, you want to gently rake or blow the leaves um, from the lawn onto the garden beds. The, the leaves that fall on your shrubs, just give them a shake so that they can fall down onto the ground. Um, leave them there naturally, and you can do this for trees, for shrubs, for perennials, for vegetables, for anything you grow. It's excellent mulch. Um, you can save your leaves to use in compost throughout the year. So um, we'll talk about compost quickly in the next section, but for to make compost, you must have leaves. Um, it's the one thing that you absolutely must have. So you have to save your leaves. If you're thinking about making compost, start in the fall and you'll save your leaves and you'll probably have enough for the whole year. Um, so generally, if you just pile them up, in a corner, they will pretty much stay there. Particularly if you put them in a corner, they don't tend to blow around because they're gonna get wet and they're kind of compact. And, um, and they will just pretty much stay there. This is somebody I know who has built a kind of a little um, jail for her leaves with some, just with some chicken wire on the side of her house and here are her compost bins. So there's different ways to store them. But um, again, Susie's probably living in there and she will thank you. Um, save your leaves even if you don't make compost because it creates habitat. Um, one of the ways to make your garden sustainable is to mimic what happens in nature. The leaves fall, they break down, um, all kinds of, um, of animals and microorganisms are living in here to um, contributing to break down the leaves. And um, you're going to be attracting birds, butterflies, fireflies, amphibians, and many, many microorganisms that are really essential to good soil. So those are the things, four things you can do with your leaves rather than blowing them to the curb. Um, very quickly about making compost, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but I'm just gonna kind of hit the high points. Compost is what happens in nature if you leave a pile of leaves. If you pile up some leaves, and you leave them there and you come back a year later, there's gonna be compost. You don't have to do a thing. You just, you just need the leaves. So here's compost and it really, it's a lovely thing. It smells wonderful. It's very nice. So this turns into this um, absolutely naturally without, any, any, without you doing anything at all. To make compost, you need a few very, very basic things. You need an out of the way place for the compost piles or bin. 
You need ground material to provide carbon, and that's the leaves for the most part. You need a leaf rake or blower to get the leaves where you want them to be, and you need a place to store the leaves. Uh, some optional equipment is a spading fork to turn the compost. I never turn my compost, but it does make it cook faster if you turn it. A piece of half inch screening chicken wire attached to a frame, and you can use that to screen the compost. Green material to provide nitrogen, and that's your kitchen scraps, um, which are not necessary, but it's a really good way to decrease the, um, the trash load. Um, it's been estimated that in, in most places, the um, uh, kitchen, kitchen refuse, you know, carrot peelings and potato peelings and eggshells is some, anywhere between 15 and 35% of the waste stream. So if you compost that stuff, you're reducing your, um, your waste stream, the amount that goes into landfills and perhaps even ultimately your taxes because you'd have to pay less for, for everybody to have to pay less. And you, you can, another optional thing is a compost bin or any, or some kind of a closed system. These are my compost piles and they are open piles. And I just want to explain very briefly what happens. If you want to compost in the open, um, the easiest way to do it is two piles, which is what you see here. I know it's hard to see. This whole area is about six feet by six feet. And it's tucked into a little recess of my house. The office window where I'm sitting is right up here. Um, I can see it all the time. It does not smell. Um, the, um, this is just a little crappy old Rubbermaid shed. But there are actually two piles here. There's a line down the center, which I realize it's hard to see, but we know where it is. This pile has been capped off with leaves and it is cooking. It's just sitting there cooking and turning into compost. This pile we are at the moment adding to. When this pile is done, we'll cap this pile off with a, with a final layer of leaves. We'll screen this pile and use it. And then we will start over again in this pile. So we always have one, one that we're adding to and one that we're cooking. If you have an open pile and you only have one pile, the compost will always be at the bottom. So it'll be, it'll be hard to get at. So um, it'll be hard to get the compost out rather than the stuff that isn't, that isn't decomposed yet. So if you wanna do open piles, and this is really easy, it's just the easiest way to do it. Um, by the way, on the, Glen, on the website, the web page of the Glenrock Environmental Commission, um, there's a set of instructions for this. There's also a, another set for doing it um, sort of in a more complicated way, but this is all on the website of the webpage of the Glen Rock Environmental Commission. Um, so really, really su super simple to do this. Um, important do's and don'ts for composting. Um, you, you must use brown material and only these things are brown material, the carbon. Fallen leaves, sawdust, wood shavings, wood chips, and straw or hay. Nothing else is brown material. Coffee grounds are green, not brown. They are, it's because of the chemical composition. It's not because of the color. You um, can use, certainly can use green material, which is kitchen refuse, grass clippings, garden debris, untreated paper. Um, on, the, on the very rare occasions where I use a paper towel and it doesn't, you know, and it just was used like to wipe up a counter quickly with water. We put that in the compost, it breaks down. Um, natural fibers such as pet hair. I have a really hairy dog. I brush him outside and I put the hair in the compost um, and it, it breaks down. Um, and I have read um, that uh, from a reliable source that you can use droppings and box material from caged indoor animals such as gerbils and rabbits. You cannot put in cat or dog feces. Um, you cannot put in the droppings of any animal that lives outdoors. So what you cannot use in compost, in a home compost pile, are any animal products, such as skin and bones and dairy products, cooked foods that contain fats. That's, this is what's gonna attract rats. People always ask that question. The feces from dogs or cats, diseased plant material or weeds that have gone to seed. The reason you can't use these three things is that a home compost pile is too small to, to develop the heat necessary to kill the disease causing microorganisms or the weed seeds. So you don't wanna put any of this in it. If you're pulling garlic mustard right now, which is a really nasty weed that's just all over the place and this is the time to pull it because it's in bloom, don't put it in your compost because it has already gone to seed. Um, so, um, so, that, so these are sort of what you do 
and what you don't do when you are um, when you are making compost. Um, there are many, many ways to compost, but all of them involve layering brown and green. And you always need to have a little bit more brown than green. Um, the, you'll see three to two or four to one, or it doesn't matter. You put a thick layer of leaves and then you put a layer of, what we do is we, we um, put our kitchen refuse here all week. And then um, over the weekend, I'll cover it with a thick layer of leaves every week. Um, it will never smell, it will never attract um, vermin. It will attract robins and um, and chipmunks and squirrels and woodchucks, critters like that, but you will never see mice and rats in it. I mean, I, I never have this is right outside my window. So there are many ways to do it. These are different kinds of closed systems that you can buy. They would come with instructions. These are two different ways to do it in, out in the open. Um, but um, there are lots of good um, instructions for making compost um, online if you've never done it before. But what I would like to emphasize is the need for the brown material, the leaves. If you don't, if you try to compost only kitchen scraps, you will not get compost. You will get smelly muck because it's the green material um, doesn't have the carbon in it and will not break down into soil. Um, if you, um, and then you, um, the, and the and the really important thing to remember is that it's a very simple process and it's what happens if a pile of leaves is just left alone. You don't need a starter, you don't need any kinds of special equipment. These things are fine if you don't want it out in the open and most people prefer to use a system like this, um, but they're, um, but, it, but it's certainly not necessary. So that is, I'm gonna take questions about all these things at the end. So to use the compost, um, you know when it's done because it will be a uniformly dark color, it smells good, and you don't see very many identifiable objects in it. Certain things like um, peach pits will take more than one cycle to break down. So like I, we, we, that's why we screen it and then we just throw them back in and you know, and they'll, the next time they'll be broken down. You can use the compost on your vegetable garden, on your lawn, somebody mentioned over um, you know, scattering when you seed or really anywhere you want to improve the soil. Um, there is no need to dig the compost into the soil. You place it on top in an even layer and the, the soil organisms will mix everything together for you. Um, you never, you never want to dig in your soil. Um, all it does is cause erosion, bring weed seeds to the surface, and confuse the soil critters, which are all living at the right layer. And when you dig, um, which people were taught to do, um, to dig stuff in and to turn soil over, you never want to do that. Um, so if you're going to use compost, just lay it on the top of the soil. And I think that is all about compost. I know I'm going very fast because there are a lot of questions. So finally, um, planting for sustainability. Um, this involves something that's very dear to my heart, which is planting native plants, um, but it also involves some other techniques that I'm going to talk about. So to go back to our sustainable garden, um, what steps can you take to make your own garden more sustainable? And I hope that everybody listening will come away with maybe one or two things, one or two specific things that they can do. Um, so again, less lawn, um, a, more, a greater variety of plants, um, much less intervention, particularly in the soil. Um, and then you will, you will have Susie and her friends. So just as a very brief review of what a, what a sustainable garden looks like. Usually involves doing less. Um, the first thing you can do to be more sustainable is to eliminate areas of lawn that you don't use. Um, you know, maybe you have small children and they need a play area, fine, um, but you probably don't need as much lawn as you have. You probably don't need your whole front lawn. Um, probably it's, I don't know, there for the neighbors to admire. But you could, for example, um, this, was a, this was a friend who said, um, Oh, the, you know, I just whatever I do, the grass just doesn't grow well, and it turned it was too shady. Of course, the grass wasn't grow well, wasn't going to grow well. So this was the area around this tree, this big tree that was planted. So what we did was we mulched this much wider area, following the line of shade from the, from the tree. Um, her choice of plants would not particularly be my choice of plants, but hey, um, you could. Uh, but we, um, we took some stuff from her garden um, and, she bought, and she bought some manuals and things, but you could plant this whole area very thickly 
this area here um, was originally part of a lawn. It's um, in a south-facing backyard, full sun. And so this lawn was turned into a native perennial garden. Um, full sun, very dry soil. And the, um, the, lawn, the, the gardens kind of came first and then the patio came around them. Or then you could, um, you could do a vegetable garden in part of it. In our area, you would have to fence a vegetable garden, but certainly you could, um, you could do that in part of it. And if you manage it organically, you're doing much better for your, um, for your environment than you would be for, for most standard lawn care. So just a few, a few ideas, tree islands, perennial beds, vegetable gardens to get to get rid of some lawn. Um, if you have shade, uh, don't try to grow lawn because it's not going to grow there. There are wonderful, wonderful native plants for shade. This is actually um, part of a very small part of the native plant garden at the New York Botanical Garden. And this picture was taken not this year, but just about this time of year. So, and it's designed naturalistically. So you see, you kind of have drifts of plants. This is Ansonia. I'm not sure anymore what this is. Uh, native sedges and grasses. It's in the shade of trees. Um, you could easily do this with a small garden um, to do a, a mix of, of native plants for shade. You could do, if you prefer greenery, you could do ferns um, in, a, in a shady garden like this. Um, you could do, if this were just like the side of your lawn that gets most of the shade, pretend it's just this part, you could very easily just plant ferns. Again, um, mulch the area. Um, the easiest way to get rid of lawn is just to mulch thickly over it in the fall. Um, by spring, it will be dead and you can plant, you can plant right through the, the, um, the, the mulch and the thatch. And um, you, you would have a shade garden in the, um, in the spring instead of fighting to get lawn to grow where it really just didn't want to grow. Um, plant native plants because Susie um, can only eat native plants. She and all her friends, they can only eat native plants. If you want to see butterflies and lightning bugs and lots of birds, you've got to have native plants. And mass your plantings. Um, wildlife needs cover, and that includes birds. Um, if you have a sea of mulch with a plant here and a plant there, um, you're not going to attract as much, as much wildlife, and it's not going to be as good for the soil because in heavy storms, that mulch is just going to be, it's going to be washed away. So plant thickly. When I start a garden, I usually recommend mulching, but as the plants fill in, you shouldn't need mulch anymore. The plants will, will fill the garden. So just a few different ideas for native plants. These are three native small trees that turn different colors in fall. This is um, a native dogwood, a flowering dogwood. This is Aronia, Aronia melanocarpa, black choke berry, um, which turns this beautiful orange. And in the middle is spice bush. And that's Susie's plant, that's what she can eat, um, which turns a beautiful golden yellow in fall. Um, so, and you, you can see they're kind of, they're all kind of crowded together. They're, there's not a lot of space between plants. Um, this is a, a perennial garden for full sun, and these plants are um, a rudbeckia, a milkweed. This is orange butterfly weed, and this is um, a plant in the mint family. It's um, Agastache funiculum, and that is um, Anis hyssa. It has um, it has a licorice smell and flavor. And it, um, you can actually eat the flowers and pull off little bits of it. You can put it in a salad, it's strong tasting. But um, this plant attracts, anything in the mint family will attract um, butterflies and other pollinators like you just wouldn't believe. Um, this is to just to show a lot of native plants, um, the foliage turns color in fall. So these are sundrops and they turn this brilliant red in fall. This is a great ground cover for a sunny area. This is another Rudbeckia that gets to be smaller and has smaller flowers and it will bloom from July through October. And my guess is that what's behind there is a heath aster. And um, uh, that very often just comes up on its own around here. It's a fairly large aster. It almost is a bush form and it has gazillions of tiny, tiny flowers, as you can see there. Um, it can actually get to be almost like a weed. So these are just plant, plant close together 
and plant native. Okay, two final slides. Native, just a very few native plants for sunny sites and for shady sites. People were asking about that. Um, if you need a small specimen tree for a sunny site, this is a service berry. This is just a detail of the flower and the foliage. Um, this plant blooms, it bloomed about two weeks ago. So it's one of the earliest things to bloom. It's exquisitely beautiful in bloom. And it, then it will make these great big purple berries that birds absolutely adore. Um, one of its common names is Juneberry because the berries ripen in June. Um, it has many, many common names and there are many cultivars available in all different sizes. So you can certainly find one to suit your property. And this plant, this tree likes sun. It's a small tree that likes sun. Um, people very often plant flowering dogwoods in sunny sites and they don't like it. So this is a really good substitute for a flowering dogwood if your site is sunny. Um, it's just absolutely beautiful. This is our native hibiscus. A lot of people have Rose of Sharon, which is a hibiscus, but it's not a native plant. Um, it is a shrub and it is invasive. If you have Rose of Sharon, you will have bazillions of seedlings. Um, it's an invasive plant. It is not good for wildlife. This is a native hibiscus. Um, it's called um, rose mallow or swamp rose mallow, although it does perfectly fine in bone dry soil as long as you have sun. This flower is as big as a dinner plate. Um, and it uh, just comes about, the plant is about six feet tall. Each flower blooms for one day. It blooms from about July through August. And then it makes um, seeds are like BBs and the birds just devour the seeds. Um, although you can manage to save some, it comes really readily from seed. My plants came from seeds that a neighbor gave me many, many years ago. Um, it's a beautiful, tall um, um, perennial like for the back of a border. So swamp rose mallow. This is our New England aster. Um, asters are phenomenally useful plants in a garden. They attract um, pollinators by the spore and many, many insects eat their foliage. Um, um, just like, um, so they're a particularly useful native plant in a garden. The deer like them too, but they always come back because they're very, very sturdy. This is a, a, one of a particularly beautiful native grass called little blue stem. Um, most of the grasses that people plant as ornamentals, the, um, the miscanthus grasses and the penicetum grasses, among others, are really highly invasive. They are devastating natural areas. Um, so I would encourage you to plant, because grasses really spread their seeds widely, um, I would encourage you to plant native grasses. Um, little blue stem really is blue. It's, it's just quite beautiful turns golden in the fall. Um, and if you, um, in this area, it grows naturally in really hot, dry sites. If you're climbing a mountain, when you get to the top, you're gonna see this in a cleft of a rock. That's the kind of site it likes. So it, there are native grasses that like more, more enriched soil, but this one is particularly tough and hardy and nothing eats it. it one of those grasses that have the silica in it. So, so nobody eats it. This is sort of a mixed garden of um, milkweed. This is orange butterfly weed. It's a milkweed that does that has to um, grow in dry soil, although there are many for other kinds of soil. And two different mints. This is um, bergamot or monarda. Um, this is the. There are two different species of monarda. Um, bee balm is the con is the common name. And then this is a very closely related plant called. Um, what is the common name? It's, um, it's Monarda punctatum, and the common name is dotted something, and I can't think of the common name, but it, um, again, um, for the most part, um, deer will not, deer and other creatures will not eat things in the mint family. What I very often do with a plant that they particularly like, like um, phlox, they love phlox, it's their favorite thing. Uh, the tall garden phlox, which is a native plant, I surround it with grasses that they don't eat and with the, uh, the mints and things that they, I just put it in there or, or I put it way to the back of the garden, can't see it, but, uh, but at least it's growing. Um, the, um, th that is one way to sort of get the phlox to bloom because otherwise they're gonna eat it immediately, I find. So just a very few native plants for sunny sites. Last slide, I promise, native plants for shady sites. Um, as I, as I mentioned, our flowering dogwood, Corn Cornus Florida, which is 
very, very often planted as an ornamental tree is most often planted incorrectly and will not be healthy. That's when they get anthracnose. If you plant them out in, out in the sun, they want shade. Um, in nature, where you'll see dogwood trees growing is under, is under oak trees in the forest. They're an understory tree. So exquisitely beautiful, but plant them in the shade. And so there are white flowering forms and pink flowering forms of our, our native dogwood is, is um, Cornus Florida. A few, um, these are all spring bloomers, but there certainly are summer and, and fall bloomers for, for shade. This is Tiarella, very common garden plant. It's native, beautiful. In the garden, it could form a, a, a ground cover. You um, know, in, in a wet area, it will spread really nicely. In a dry area, it'll just kind of stay put. Um, but it's um, it's a really pretty ground cover. It's in bloom right now. This is blood root. My husband takes these gorgeous pictures that I think make the plants look like they have human faces almost. They almost have expressions. But um, so the really good pictures, you can tell my husband took them. I didn't take them. Um, this is this is bloodroot, which is one of our very first um, native plants to bloom. So we need early blooming plants for pollinators because the bees wake up early. Um, it's very small. It's only about six inches tall and it's done blooming already. Very, very pretty. Um, our native geranium. Um, this is the, um, the only showy species that's native. Um, it's a super easy plant to grow. You can actually yank the rhizomes out of the ground while it's in bloom, put them down somewhere else and it'll go right on blooming. It's, um, I did it yesterday. There's nothing, nothing to it. Very, very pretty. And then it will disappear after it's done blooming for the year. So you plant something else above it. And this is our native columbine. It's another plant of, um, you will see it growing out of a, a cliff in the rock in nature. Um, so it, it has to have dry soil because it's taprooted. It has a root like a carrot and most taprooted plants cannot survive in, in really wet soil. Um, if you have dry soil and it's happy, it will sell seed like crazy. Um, the, when you see columbines that have white flowers or blue flowers or purple flowers or pink, those are not the native plant. The native plant is um, Aquilegia canadensis, and this is the coloring it has. And in my garden, this is what attracts hummingbirds. Um, when the, this is going to be blooming, um, it will be blooming within a few days, and the hummingbird, the hummingbird should reach us by migration at about the same time. So this is, this is um, where I will see hummingbirds. Um, so um, again, very, all of these are extremely easy to grow. And that is the end. Here are some references here. Um, if you want some more information about the Watering Smart site, Doug Tallamy is an entomologist who speaks and writes very, very widely about, um, about the importance of native plants. He has written two books and um, they will, really explain why you should rethink your lawn as well as well as how to do it. There is an organization called Jer Jersey Friendly Yards that has an excellent website. They are primarily in South Jersey, but, um, th but they have lots of good information for us. Um, so um, one of the things they focus on is, is replanting a lawn as other stuff. In Westchester, um, it's a very similar organization called Healthy Yards, and this is, their web, this is their website. A lot of the plants from South Jersey are actually not native here. It's a different ecosystem. So Westchester is actually closer to us in terms of um, what the landform is like and what, which plants are native. So this may be a little bit more useful. And then um, I would recommend that you look at the website of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, which has lots and lots of information. And there is also um, an excellent webinar series that is, um, that is ongoing it's since the pandemic, um, but, it, but it's ongoing. And you can also see um, the activities of different chapters. So for example, um, our Bergen Passaic chapter next week, next Wednesday night, We'll have a talk by Don Torino, who is the president of uh, Bergen Audubon, and he's he's sort of legendary in this area, um, in in terms of, um, of of birding and the importance of native plants. But he's going to discuss very specifically how to get a garden certified as a um, as a wildlife habitat um, through Bergen Audubon because they have a program to do that. And that is the end of what I have to say. And I think you're going to send. These references, if anybody wants them, you can send you can send these references. Yeah. yeah. So I'm happy to take your questions. And I have I hope I haven't gone too long.
<laughs> do you have a few more minutes for any questions? Yeah, no, it's, it's fine with me. It's up to you. Great. Oh, great. Because we still have some more. Uh, Mark is wondering if you break the leaves up first for compost. No, no, just put them on. Yeah, you, there's no need to chop the leaves for compost. And actually, I'm mulch. Or, or for mulch. About the, um, using leaves uh, in your compost. When you um, when you do that, does it kill the larva for the butterfly? Because we always use put leaves in our compost bins, and I mean it gets kind of hot. I mean, is it too hot for the butterfly? It probably, yeah, it probably is going to kill the larva that you're using for the compost. But you never use it all. I mean, you're going to have some of it is always. I'm, I mean, I generally don't use up all my leaves. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it probably it probably is going to kill them, and they're going to you know they're going to be broken down as part of the organic matter eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have another question. If we are changing part of our lawn to native wildflowers, do we need to kill the grass first before putting down the native wildflower seeds? Yes, you absolutely need to kill the grass first because the grass will outcompete the wild the wildflowers any day. Um, there are, it's really hard to establish a native garden from seed. I would recommend that you kill your lawn and then start with plants. And there are really good suppliers that will send you little tiny plants cheap so you could get a lot of plants but um, it's really hard to do it from seed because um, native plants um, first of all they have to have a cold period before they can germinate so the seeds produced this year are going to germinate next year not this year first of all second of all most native prairie plants which is what we're talking about they're they're um, adapted to um, to you know sunny open areas they develop enormous root systems. They can, the root systems can be four, five, six, eight feet long. Same thing for native grasses. That takes a couple of years. The first year, most native plants, milkweeds, for example, the first year, um, they're going to be that big. That's all, four or five inches, and they're just going to stop growing. And what's happening is that they're developing enormous root systems. Um, and then the next year, you'll get, you know, a, a plant a foot high, which may bloom late. They're really going to not look good till, till the third year. And this is just nature. This is just how it works. In the meantime, if you don't mow that area, your grass is going to be 12 feet tall. So you really can't um, and the weeds will have come in and you won't be able to tell the difference between the weeds and the native plants because they're so tiny. So I would strongly recommend killing the lawn and starting with plants and not with seed. Um, you can't just scatter seed and, and get a native meadow. Um, it just doesn't work. Also, you want to include some grasses in your um, in your meadow, because um, some native grasses, because um, there actually are a lot of butterflies that eat, eat native grasses that's their larval food. There are whole families of butterflies that only eat grasses. Um, and also the roots are complementary. Um, the, um, if, you, if you plant the grasses with the, um, with the uh, flowering plants, the flowering plants are much less likely to flop. So uh, they'll, you know, everything will be, sort of grow nice and straight and tall if you do it that way. So I, I really would not recommend starting from seed. That's some good advice. Um, and I think I'm going to skip the, the next question is name the shady plants again. But since you, uh, we will have the recording up soon, so we can yeah. go back to that. So, um, and someone's wondering that what the color of the native columbine was. Um, orange and yellow. And or sometimes our, more red than, but, but red and yellow or orange and yellow. Yeah. And I think our last question for the evening, uh, David has an interesting one. Um, are native plants no longer appropriate to plant in North Jersey due to climate change? For example, should we be planting what typically, typically grows in Maryland, especially when we plan for the future? Well, a lot of them have always been the same. A lot of plants that are native to this area will have uh, their, uh, their species name will be Virginiana or Marylandensis because they, um, the, the range was always down to there. But yeah, um, I'm looking at plants from the south now. Um, plants from the southeast from similar habitats, plants from that grew in high elevations in the south. Yeah, I'm looking at those. I think I think it is going to extend. Yeah, um, there, we're going to have some problems with certain uh, species of trees because of climate change. Um, you know, the trees that have always done well in this area. So yeah, it's going to change. Nobody knows exactly what's going to happen, but it's certainly going to change. Yeah. But in the meantime, we still have to support the ecosystem that we have here, but... Mm -hmm. Well, I think that is 
it for our questions and our comments. And oh my gosh, thank you so much, everybody. And thank you so much, Elaine. This was so fascinating and really so illuminating. And I am, was, we're so lucky to have you speak to us tonight and to answer so many questions. Yeah, well, it was my pleasure. It could. As you can tell I like to talk about this. <laughs> this is, it was a win-win. <laughs> um, I also wanted to, um, you're welcome. Everybody. And I also wanted to call everyone's attention to our next program is going to be on trees. We'll have um, Joel Flagler from uh, many organizations. Uh, he's a, um, from Rutgers and uh, the uh, Bergen Extension um, and Audubon Society, I think. I, he, well, he will be talking about uh, maintaining trees, selecting trees and maintaining them here in Ridgewood, what you can do to um, keep them living long and um, prospering here. Um, so that will be on um, June 2nd, uh, Wednesday, June 2nd um, in the afternoon. It'll be at two o'clock. We'll also be recording that too and we'll put it up on the sustainability um, channel on our uh, YouTube, our sustainability um, playlist on our YouTube channel. Um, so I think that's it for this evening. Thank you so much, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. And thank you, everybody, also. Have, have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.